1 Corinthians chapter 11 is where we are tonight in our study of God's Word. If you would turn there, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Tonight we'll pick up where we left off this morning. We'll pick up at verse 20 and read down to verse 34. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak, and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Let's ask God's blessing on our time in His Word tonight. Lord, we come to this time joyfully, thanking You for the privilege that we have tonight to declare Your truth. Lord, we also come to this time fearfully, knowing that this is Your Word. It's not ours to do with as we please. These are your people, blood-bought, precious to you. And this is a time that's holy, that we will give an account for, Lord. And so I ask you to strengthen me, to help me. As I strive to do your will, as I strive to do my best for you, I pray that you would help me tonight to deliver your word in a way that you would be pleased with. Lord, take your mighty sword in hand. And deal in our hearts in a way that our lives are changed forever. I pray for my brothers and my sisters and myself that, Lord, we would grow as a result of tonight. And I pray for anyone in our midst who is lost and ask, Lord, that you would open their heart. That they would see their need for your Son. That they would be brought to a place of real repentance and faith in Christ. And, Lord, we will be very careful to give you thanks. For you alone can do that work which will stand the test of eternity. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we consider the question, when is correction the thing that's needed? When is correction the need of the day? And we saw four things in verses 17 through 19. We said that correction is needed when a church is thinking in a way or behaving in a way that's not commendable. When we are thinking in a way or living in a way that is not praiseworthy, 
We talked about the fact that the Lord Jesus knows us. He knows His churches. He walks in the midst of His churches, and He's able, just as we saw in the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, He's able to give us that perfect diagnosis of where we are pleasing to Him and where we are displeasing to Him. And we ask, how can we as a local church examine ourselves? How can we as individuals examine ourselves, asking what is commendable and what is in need of correction? And the answer is, we find that in Scripture. God's will is known in God's Word. And so, correction is needed whenever in the light of Scripture, we find that we're thinking in a way, living in a way that's not praiseworthy. Being more specific, we said that correction is needed when the church's gatherings are not constructive. Paul said an amazing thing to this church. He said, in effect, it would have been better for you not to meet. When you come together, it's not for the better, it's for the worse. It's not for good, it's for bad. And so whenever a church's meetings no longer represent edification, the building up of the saints of God, that church is in need of correction. We talked about how the church of our time has turned ministry on its head that we have bought into a lie that the church gathers together for evangelism and disperses for maturity when in reality just the opposite is true. The saints of God gather together to be taught to praise God in song, in word, in giving, to edify one another in fellowship. We gather for the saints and then we disperse to evangelize. When a church is no longer gathering for edification, when the meeting of the church is actually to the harm of believers, when it becomes hurtful to believers, that church is in need of correction. Third, we saw that a church is in need of correction when there is not consistency in the fellowship, when there are divisions, schisms in the body. One of the first signs of an unhealthy church is that there begins to be within that fellowship uh, wars and rumors of war, gossip, backbiting, hurt feelings, unforgiveness, division, schisms. And so whenever that's going on, we're in need of correction. And then finally, we saw that correction is needed when the time comes for the approved to be tested. We said that even though division in itself is never a pleasing thing to God, it does have a purpose. And Paul states that purpose... In verse 19 when he says there, there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine or approved passing the test, those who have passed the test among you may be recognized. Let a church face a crisis and you're going to find out who the mature are in the midst of that body. Let a church face a crisis and you're going to, face, you're going to find out who those people are who have been truly converted, who truly belong to the Lord. But now we get even more specific, beginning with verse 20. Why exactly is Paul not able to commend this church in this section? He commended them earlier, back up in verse 2, where they were worthy of praise. He praised them. But specifically, why is he concerned in these verses? In what way has their meeting together become harmful, hurtful? Where have the divisions become obvious? Where do the approved need to stand out? And the specific issue that he brings before their vision is what is going on at the Lord's Supper. What is taking place at the Lord's Supper? And you mark this tonight, beloved. We cannot have wrong thinking, wrong attitudes. We cannot be indulging the flesh in our private life and it not spill over into our public worship. Show me a group of people who aren't thinking right and they won't worship right. We can't have wrong attitudes and right worship. We can't have wrong thinking and right worship. We can't have wrong relationships and right worship. We've already seen in, the, in this letter that the Corinthian church was suffering from a great many things. The chief of which was probably pride. 
their love of human philosophy, all the things we've seen in this letter, it all stems from an overestimation of oneself. That we're not walking in humility. And that pride, that worldliness, is spilling out in their public gatherings, and specifically at the Lord's Supper. And so tonight, in verses 20 through 34, I want us to see four things about the Lord's Supper in the context of what's going on in Corinth. We're going to look at the perversion of the Lord's Supper, the preservation of the Lord's Supper, the power in the Lord's Supper, and then the proper approach to the Lord's Supper. All of this in the context of what was going on in this church. And as we do that, let us examine ourselves. Now the first thing he points out is how they were perverting the Lord's Supper. Now you know the Lord has given two ordinances to the church. There's baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism points to the beginning of our life in Christ. It points to our union with Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper reminds us of the cost of our redemption, but it also reminds us of the continuance of our life with Christ. We feed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We live out of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we continually come back to the Lord's table as a reminder of how the Lord saved us. But we don't just look backward, do we? We also look forward to the Lord's return. And so it speaks of our ongoing walk with the Lord and how we need the Lord Jesus Christ every moment of every day. We live our lives in Him, feeding on Him. They had perverted what the Lord's Supper was meant to represent. Verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Now, we don't know all of the details about this. It's impossible from what we are able to gather to know all of the details of it, but it is apparent that when the churches were celebrating the Lord's Supper early on, they did so in conjunction with a meal. Some have referred to it as the love feast, but it was some kind of fellowship meal, and probably after eating together at the conclusion of the meal, they would then partake of the elements representing the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. They would partake in the Lord's table, but it was all involved in a, in a supper, in a meal. The Lord's Supper. The Lord is the host. We are the guests, members of His family, joined to one another, members one of another, celebrating our life in Him, celebrating the fact that we belong to Him and belong to one another in Him. Union in salvation is pictured in that supper. And Paul says in verse 20 that what you're partaking of, you call the Lord's Supper, but it's not the Lord's Supper. You, you have so misunderstood it, you have so perverted it, that no matter what you call what you're doing, it is not the Lord's Supper. If you have the ESV Study Bible, I thought they captured it well in their comments on that verse. It says this, because of their selfish elitism, when the Corinthians observe the Lord's Supper, they are not rightly representing the sacrificial death of Christ and the true character of the Lord. In the Lord's Supper, we are reminded of the selfless sacrifice of Jesus for our salvation. But now that supper that reminds us of his selfless sacrifice is being remembered by the Corinthians through selfish acts. How can you celebrate his selfless sacrifice through selfish acts? But that's what they were doing. By the way, just a couple of references to the fact that they celebrated the Lord's table with a meal. We have an indication of that here. But also in the book of Jude in the 12th verse, referring to false teachers. It says, These are blemishes on your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, looking after themselves, 
waterless clouds, swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. One of the things those false teachers would do is mix themselves into the fellowship of the church and they would be present at the love feasts. 2 Peter 2.13 says the same thing. Suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. While they feast with you. So there were feasts, there were meals as the church came together for public worship and to remember the Lord through the table that he ordained. Well, notice what they were doing at this meal. Verse 20, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Why not? Well, verse 21, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, and another gets drunk. You have selfishness at the table. People going ahead with their own meal and... In all likelihood, that refers to beginning to eat prior to everyone showing up. Probably the, the rich would gather first and they were partaking of their meal. The poor would arrive later and there would be nothing left for them. In fact, he goes on to say this. He says, in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. And then he says, one goes hungry. Not only selfishness being demonstrated at the table, but callousness being demonstrated at the table. I mean, not caring about each other. Not caring that someone would be hungry. Not caring that someone would be doing without. In fact, it must have been a very embarrassing situation for these people, because look at verse 22. I mean, with indignation, he says, What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? I mean, if you're just hungry and thirsty, stay home. You can do that at home. Notice, or do you despise the church of God? I mean, this kind of behavior is to show despite for God's people. And then notice the next thing he says. He says, and humiliate those who have nothing. They come to this common meal in the name of love, this common meal in the name of Christ, this common meal in the name of the church, and you have those who have something going ahead of others, satisfying their hunger and their thirst, and those who have nothing arriving at the table and being humiliated because they have nothing. But it gets even worse. You not only have selfishness at the table and callousness at the table, you also have carousing at the table because he says another gets drunk. Can you imagine the public worship gathering of the church and someone is drunk in the name of the Lord's Supper, in the name of a gathering that is to remind us of the love of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, the cost of our redemption. And people are behaving in this kind of way. There may have been social distinctions present, not only in the timing of the individual eating, but the location of it. Gordon Fee in his commentary on 1 Corinthians Uh, follows that line of thought, that not only, when he says, goes ahead with your meal, not only perhaps is the idea one of timing, but location, that the rich would section themselves off from the poor so that they're enjoying their meal like you would if you were going out to eat somewhere while the poor in the congregation are left here with nothing to enjoy. We don't have all the details, but the basic picture is clear. We have no problem grasping it. Selfishness, callousness, carousing in the name of Christ. Gordon Fee comments, what he will not let them do is bring such distinctions to the common meal of believers where Christ had made them all one 
signified by their all eating of the one loaf, chapter 10, verse 17, by carrying over into these meals a number of privileged status aspects of both private and religious meals. The rich were in effect destroying the church as one body in Christ. Now the church, you see, is divided by classes. And what has Paul just been talking about? What's present in the body? Divisions, schisms, tears. What shall I say to you into verse 22? Shall I commend you in this? I mean, is this commendable thinking? Is this commendable behavior? Is this praiseworthy? I will not. They had perverted the Lord's Supper. Second, not only the perversion of the Lord's Supper, verses 23 through 26, we see the preservation of it. How, how do you deal with such a perversion? Well, you, you don't praise them for it, which in effect is to rebuke them for it. But you've got to do something else. You've got to remind them of the true significance of it. You've got to take them back and recapture for their thinking what the Lord's Supper really is. And that's what he does in verse 23. For I received from the Lord. Here's why I can't praise you for your behavior. Here's why, because here's what the Lord's Supper is. Verse 23. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. Why does Paul magnify the truth that the Lord's Supper was instituted on the night when Jesus was betrayed? Because what a clear picture of the selfless love of Jesus Christ that on the night when there was such disloyalty demonstrated toward him, he loved his own to the end. In the face of disloyalty, in the face of unfaithfulness, in the face of sinful behavior toward himself, he, on this night, instituted the supper that would remind us all of how he would give himself nothing withheld in order to save us from our sins. On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Isn't it an amazing thing that Jesus did? That on the night when he's, he was betrayed, on a night when he knows he is on his way to the cross, in a way that no doubt his disciples could not fully comprehend, he is already pointing them toward their future relationship with himself. They are headed toward a relationship with him that would no longer be one of sight, but one of faith. One where they would need to remember. Remember him. Remember what he had done for them. And specifically, remember his sacrifice for them. This is my body, he says. That is, this bread symbolizes his body. And this life of his is being given for them, for you. I won't take an aside tonight, but when we remember that the death of our Lord is substitutionary, we are reminded again in that statement that Jesus died for a specific people. He came to save his people from their sins. His body is being given for his people. For the sheep, 
He lays down his life for the sheep. That's what this good shepherd does. His blood will be shed to bring about this salvation relationship that was promised throughout all of the Old Testament times, but now it's new in the sense, not that we've gone from works to grace, it's always been by grace, but new in the sense that all that was promised was now coming to pass. All that was promised would now move from shadow to reality, ratified by His own blood. Do this, he says, verse 25, Paul giving us the Lord's words. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I think it's important that we understand that the Lord's Supper represents a great transition. The first Lord's Supper also represented the last true Passover observance. Jesus took the Passover and transformed it into the Lord's Supper. As one writer put it, two lines met in the gas chamber and a switch was thrown. That in the death of Christ, you had the, in the celebration of the Passover, pointing to the death of Christ on this night, you have the last true Passover observance. And I know that, that the Jews today would debate that. But we, knowing the truth of Christ, we understand this was the last true Passover observance. And at the same time, it is transitioned at the right time, the perfect time, this very moment, into a supper that would point us backward. You see, the Passover looks forward to something that will be fulfilled in all of its fullness in Christ. Not a physical deliverance from Egypt. Not a physical deliverance for the people of God, but a spiritual, a greater deliverance, a spiritual deliverance through the blood of God's Son. One looks forward, the other looks back. And at the center is the cross, the finished work of Jesus Christ. I want you for a moment to keep your Bible marker here and go over to the book of Exodus, chapter 12. Christ is keeping the Passover with his disciples on the night when the last, it was the last supper, when the first Lord's Supper was instituted, Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then, sh then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, Roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, why is it called the Passover? Next verse. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day 
and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. There's the Passover. What was it? It was a memorial. It was something by which you were to remember a physical deliverance from bondage in Egypt by means of a sacrifice. This unblemished, spotless lamb was to be slain. The blood applied to the house and your house would be passed over. The Lord would not execute judgment on the house where the blood was applied. But concerning the future, it prefigured a spiritual deliverance from bondage to sin and Satan from the doom of God's wrath by means of the sacrifice. So it was meant to prefigure the deliverance wrought by Christ. Richard, how do you know that it was meant to picture Jesus? Well, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, speaking to the church, as you really are unleavened, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Isn't that amazing? It was Jesus to us. He is our Passover lamb. He is the one whose blood has been applied to us so that the Lord passes over. We do not come under the wrath and judgment of God. Look back to the New Testament, please. Look at Matthew chapter 26. And we see where Jesus does what Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 11. Exodus 12 was the first Passover. In Matthew 26, we meet with the first Lord's Supper. And look at verse 26. Matthew 26, verse 26. Now as they were eating, they are partaking of the Passover observance. Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now that is a brand new significance to what is going on in the Passover meal. Christ perfectly fulfilled the law. He could not have done this if it were not the right time. If it were not legal, if it were not allowable. Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink it, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Think about it. You have in the Passover observance, you have a lamb that is unblemished. We know what that points us to, right? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and He's without spot or blemish, Peter writes. In the Passover, you had the danger clearly spelled out by God. There was going to be death in every home. In every home that night, there was death. There was either going to be the death of the firstborn or the death of a lamb. Either the death of the firstborn or the death of a substitute. In the Passover, we have the result of the sacrifice. God passed over, guarded, spared those where the blood was applied. Deliverance. In the Passover observance, you see the need for faith. Why would someone obey the instructions of God? Why would they on the tenth day take the lamb, set it aside? By the way, four days of observing that lamb to make sure it really was without blemish. Isn't it amazing that Christ came to live for us and die for us? He was indeed the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was without spot or blemish, yet He lived His life right before our very eyes, and no one could find any guilt in Him. He was examined and found to be spotless. Why would you take the Lamb on the tenth day, sacrifice it on the fourteenth day, apply the blood to your house because you believed? Faith, that's why someone would have acted. Faith, that's why the blood would be applied. 
There is no salvation apart from faith. There is no salvation apart from believing God concerning His way of saving sinners. The carrying out of the sacrifice, the whole community at twilight would sacrifice those lambs. Picturing the rejection of Christ and His condemnation. The unleavened bread, His humanity, His body, which would speak of His entire person. The incarnation, God-man, God come from heaven, taking to Himself a sinless human nature forever in one person. God and humanity. The wine, His blood, His death, which was necessary for our salvation. The wages of sin is death. Either we die for our sins or someone who did not deserve it would die in our place. There's only one person who was qualified whose death was of sufficient value to take care of all the sins of all those who will ever trust in Him, and that's Christ. And then in the Lord's Supper, look back at 1 Corinthians 11, there's a look to the future. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. The table is ordained to be a perpetual reminder of the cost of our redemption, an opportunity for confessing our sins and for cleansing, a reminder of the need for unity, a proclamation of the gospel, and a looking forward to His return. He didn't tell us how often we were to do it, but He tells us as often as we do it, that is the true significance of it. Think about what the Corinthians were doing. Taking their meal before others. Humiliating the poor in their midst. Getting drunk at the Lord's table. Is that the Lord's Supper? And so he takes their perversion of it and he exposes it in the light of the true purpose of it. So he preserves it. This is the Lord's Supper. This is the Lord's table. Third, verses 27 through 32, we're reminded of the power in the Lord's Supper. Beloved, do you remember, I mean, as we partake of the Lord's Supper together, are you reminded that what we're engaging in is not some superficial, merely human sort of observance? Do you, do you remind yourself that the Lord is present with us? That there's fellowship that occurs where the Lord's Supper is properly observed and there is examination and judgment where it is not properly observed. In other words, it, when the Lord's Supper is partaken of, there's something here that is sobering, real, powerful, fearful, Verse 27, whoever therefore, in light of what the Lord's Supper is, in light of what it really represents, then listen, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. There's just so much here for us to reflect on. First of all, he says in verse 27, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. What does that mean? In an unworthy manner. Well, he's not talking about the worthiness of the person who partakes 
He's not asking you to examine, am I worthy of this? Because there is no one worthy of it. Now he's talking about eating and drinking in an unworthy manner. You are, you're thinking about it, you're behaving toward it in a way contrary to the truth about Jesus, contrary to the example of Jesus. I mean, exactly what we're seeing in the Corinthian church. Look at what they were doing. It's not in keeping with the truth about Christ. Look at what they were doing. It's not in keeping with the character of Christ. And so when we partake in a way that ignores the true meaning of the supper, that is to partake of it in an unworthy way. Notice what kind of guilt this incurs. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body... Well, let me back up. Verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, here it is, will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. What does that mean? It means you make a mockery of the sacrifice of Christ. To understand what the body of Christ means and the blood of Christ means, to understand the cost, the great cost of your salvation, a salvation you profess to possess, and then to act in a way at the Lord's Supper that is absolutely contrary to everything about Jesus and what He did to save you, is to actually treat His sacrifice in a way that despises it. You treat it as something cheap, profane, worthless. That's a great guilt, wouldn't you agree? The third thing to notice, verse 28, let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We're never to come to the Lord's table without reflection. We're never to come to the Lord's table without examination. And and what we're examining, what we're discerning, verse 29 is this, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. What's he referring to there with the body? Well, I agree with those who say, because he doesn't repeat blood. You notice throughout the section he's talking about the body and the blood, but here he just talks about the body. So I believe that the reference to body in verse 29 is not the body of the Lord, his physical body, but the body of the Lord, his church. When we come to the Lord's Supper, not only are we to discern Christ and what He did for us to save us, but we're also to discern what it means to be a part of His body. What it means to be joined to Him. What it means to belong to the family of God. And when I come to the Lord's table in a selfish way, in a calloused way, In a carousing way, if I would despise the church of God, if I would humiliate my brothers, I don't understand the first thing about the church. I don't understand our new identity, which is in Christ Jesus, it's not rich and poor, educated, uneducated, male, female. Different races. We're all one new man in Christ. What is most important is the treasure that we have in salvation. Do we understand that about the church? Are we breaking it up according to all these earthly divisions that lost men recognize? For them to be behaving the way they were was to carry into the church gatherings the same kind of distinctions they knew out in the world. The rich having no regard for the poor because after all they're poor. You don't understand the church. And what do you do when you eat and drink that way? Verse 29, you eat and drink judgment on yourself. That's something the Lord will judge. What kind of judgment is this? Well, it's clear in the context here, he's talking about the judgment of God's people. This is not everlasting judgment, the wrath of God. This is not hell. This is discipline. Beloved, you do believe the Lord disciplines His people. Amen? And He will discipline us for selfish, sinful, 
behavior. Verse 30, that's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Weak, weariness, without strength. Can I ask you, do you you sense strength in your walk with the Lord? Or are you spiritually weak? Are you without strength? Do you find yourself weary? Without spiritual energy? Without spiritual faithfulness? Could it be because you're not dealing with the sin in your life? All sickness is not the result of sin. We know that. Read the book of 3 John, where John wishes for the beloved Gaius that he would be in as good a condition physically as he was spiritually. He says, I pray that you you would prosper physically the way your soul prospers. So there's a man who was doing well spiritually, but not physically. All sickness is not the result of sin, but, verse 30 tells us, there can be sickness that is the result of sin. Because of your abuses at the Lord's Supper, he says, some of you are sick. And in fact, when there is hard-hearted, unrepentant, blatant disregard for holy things, it can even result in death. Some of you have died. Beloved, I tell you, I don't know how, how some people work this into their theology. I mean, where it's all positive, it's all lollipops and candy. And there's no longer anything to tremble at in the Lord's church. What do you do with that verse? That because of a disregard for what the Lord's Supper really is, some of these people had died. You say, well, I don't want that kind of judgment. Anybody here feel that way? I don't want that kind of judgment. Well, here's here's the way to avoid it. Verse 31. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Is that not a sweet word from God? Do you know how to avoid God's disciplining judgment? Just judge yourself. Be honest. Be true about it. Look for, in the light of Scripture, what your sin is. And when you recognize your sin, confess it. Repent of it. Turn from it. Be rid of it. And guess what? If you will deal with your sin, God will not judge you with discipline. That's also, by the way, a very sweet word about the reality of forgiveness. You know, the Lord doesn't go on judging you forever for things that you have truly confessed and repented of. If you will judge yourself truly, you, in general terms, you will not be judged. There's something else that we need to recognize, even when we are judged. It's loving. It's for a purpose. In fact, the fact that we are judged speaks of the reality of salvation. If you can behave in sinful ways like this and not be judged, then you're not the Lord's. Because look at verse 32. But when we are judged by the Lord, when we will not judge our own sins, when we go on stubbornly in things that are contrary to God's Word. What happens? We're judged by the Lord. We are disciplined, verse 32, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. There's a great distinction here between discipline and condemnation. The world will one day be condemned by God in its sins. But God disciplines us as His children. that we might be kept from that final and ultimate condemnation. How does the Lord preserve His people in faith? How does the Lord preserve His people? He disciplines them as a father. And He keeps us in the way of belief, in the way of faith, in the way of obedience. 
So you have the perversion of it, the preservation of it. You see the power in it. This is not some lighthearted thing we engage in when we, when we dishonor it and profane it. We're treading on dangerous ground. Finally, verses 33 and 34, we have the proper approach to it. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together it will not be for judgment. He says, wait for each other. That is, show kindness, show consideration, care for each other. He says, if you're hungry, take care of that at home. That is, when you come together for this meal, don't let your primary focus be the satisfying of your own desires. There's a better setting for that. You come ready to share. You make sure that the hungry are taken care of. You can satisfy your hunger later. If you have more, you make sure that those who have less are not humiliated, are not left out. Make sure that when you gather together, it's not for judgment. Make sure it's for the better, not for the worse. You say, Richard, well... How do we apply this? I think first, the clearest way is we need to make sure we handle properly this ordinance that the Lord has given to His church. What was true for them is true for us. We need to approach the Lord's table in a way that reflects what it really is. But what is reflected at the Lord's table is true all the time in the way that we relate to each other. Let us not live toward each other selfishly. Let us not live toward each other in a calloused fashion, not caring about one another. Let us not divide the body up into classes. Rich people, poor people, smart people, dumb people. I put myself there, all right? Let's understand where our identity is found. It's found in Christ. Where our treasure is at, it's it's in Him. And that we all are precious to the Lord Jesus, having been bought by His blood, so that we treat each other in light of the preciousness that each member of His family has to Him. Otherwise, we invite judgment. We invite discipline. And let us not gather together for judgment. Where is your life right now? not honoring the Lord's sacrifice. He gave His life to save you from your sins and to produce for God a holy people who live for God with all their hearts. Where is your life right now not reflecting the true purpose of the sacrifice of Jesus? Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that we would take this word that we have seen today and examine ourselves in the light of that perfect mirror. That we would be willing to judge ourselves truly so that we would not be judged. I pray, Lord, that we would be a people swift to deal with our own sins. Not inviting your discipline, not inviting your judgment, but judging ourselves truly. So that our thinking and our attitudes and our behavior would truly be commendable before you. I pray, Lord, that you would protect us from comparing ourselves among ourselves. But that we would compare ourselves to the holy, pure standard of your word. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. If you should mark iniquities, who could stand?
We thank You for the mercy that has made us Your children. We thank You for our Savior, His body that was given for us, His blood that was shed that we might know these new covenant realities. Father, we give You praise and thanks for the Lamb of God, our Lord and our Savior, our King. Our desire, Lord, is that we would love Him more and serve Him better each day. We pray this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll be dismissed with song.